Hi, my name is Dr. Aliza Norwood. I'm an assistant professor of internal medicine at the Dell Medical School in Austin, Texas, and medical director at the Austin location of Vivent Health, uh, which is a patient-centered medical home for people living with HIV. And I'm happy to present today on HIV and transgender health. I have no conflicts to declare. And the learning objectives for today um, are, I'm going to describe the epidemiology of HIV in the transgender community. I'm gonna review factors that impact the HIV care continuum that are specific to transgender individuals. And I'll discuss the impact of gender affirming care on HIV prevention and treatment. So I'm gonna start with what we call the gender bread person. Um, and this is really just a brief review of some common terms and concepts. So gender refers to a person's internal sense of their identity, and it lies along a spectrum um, of male to female, but can be really anything in between. So non-binary, gender fluid, and gender diverse are all terms that can refer to a person who does not identify as traditionally male or female. Um, and gender expression um, uh, is uh, a bit different. It's how someone chooses to present their gender to others. So for instance, somebody may have a different gender identity than their outward gender expression. Um, this may be personal preference or style, uh, but it can also be from external factors. For example, somebody who is assigned male at birth, uh, but has a female gender identity may still choose to present themselves to the outside world as male with a male gender expression if they feel unsafe um, living as a transgender person and to the outside world. So although gender expression can often be an indicator of somebody's internal sense of identity, we can't always assume their gender identity based on their outward expression. Moving down the gender bred person, um, biologic sex refers to specifically genitalia. So when a baby is born, they are generally assigned a female sex if they have a vagina and a male sex if they have a penis. Um, intersex babies um, are often surgically altered to conform to this kind of binary sex, um, although that practice is under pressure from intersex advocates and others to change. And then finally, sexual and romantic attraction um, refer to um, somebody's um, attraction uh, along, again, a scale of uh, female to male. Uh, and can be anything in between and is not related to the other characteristics that I discussed. So other definitions, when we say transgender, we're referring to a person whose gender identity differs from uh, that sex that was assigned at birth. Cisgender means that the gender identity is the same as the birth assigned sex. AMAB and AFAB are terms that are sometimes used, assigned male at birth or assigned female at birth, uh, and are sometimes, depending on the person, preferred over male to female or female to male, which are other terms you may hear, um, because the idea is that the person is not actually male if they were just assigned male at birth. And then finally, non-binary or gender non-conforming, gender fluid, the terms I mentioned before, um, this just generally reflects reflects that there are many people who don't lie along that, uh, who don't lie um, at either binary, uh, and they may or may not identify as transgender. So then gender affirming care is care that supports congruency with a person's gender identity. This can be along a spectrum of social gender care, so affirming somebody's identity by using their chosen name and pronouns, medically through hormone replacement therapy or gender affirm affirming hormones, surgically and other services that all go into. Gender dysphoria is distress or discomfort that occurs when a person's assigned gender is not congruent with their gender identity. And gender euphoria, which we don't always hear about, um, is a feeling of joy or satisfaction that occurs when a person's assigned gender is congruent with their gender identity and when they are affirmed. So when we talk about gender affirming care, we're generally talking about healthcare. Uh, although again, just the use of chosen name and pronouns and social settings can also be a form of care. Um, and so this is healthcare that holistically attends to transgender people's physical, mental, and social health needs and well-being while respectively affirming their gender identity. I'm going to go a little bit into the epidemiology of uh, transgender population in the United States. 
So um, a caveat is that the U.S. Census has not historically accounted for gender identity um, uh, in census um, surveys. So these numbers are likely underreported. However, coming down the pipeline, the newest phase of the U.S. Census, uh, US Census Bureau's Household Poll Survey will now ask respondents their sexual orientation and gender identity in addition to their assigned sex. Um, so we'll have better data in the future. So in the U.S., we estimate that about 1 to 1.4 million people identify as transgender. Texas actually has the fifth highest prevalence for people who identify as transgender as residents. Um, and they make up about 0.7% of the total population of Texas. And just remembering that a little bit over a third of people um, who identify as transgender also identify as non-binary or gender diverse. So not specifically trans male or trans female. Um, in terms of HIV incidence specifically amongst those who identify as transgender, uh, we know that there are a lot of disparities um, and that uh, people who identify as transgender have higher incidence of HIV. As with cisgender people, the South has the highest number of new HIV diagnoses in transgender people. Um, and you can see here on the left that Texas in particular is one of the states with uh, higher incidence rates. The National Transgender Discrimination Survey reported that transgender people of color report exponentially higher rates of HIV. The highest rates were 24.9% for transgender African Americans or Blacks, um, compared to an overall rate uh, in the United States of 2.4% for African Americans. Um, so much, much higher burden um, in transgender people and particularly transgender women of color. About 10.9% um, of Latinx populations, who, who uh, people who identify as transgender, um, report having HIV as compared again to a rate of about 0.6% in the general US population. So we know that in international studies, transgender women have about a 49 times odd of having HIV compared to the general population. Um, and we have a little bit more data about trans women. Um, there have been few studies done on HIV prevalence among transgender men and gender non-conforming people. Um, but there is reason to believe that these communities are also more vulnerable to HIV than the general population. Um, and those racial disparities also hold uh, amongst uh, trans men and gender non-conforming people. So we think in uh, pretty vague estimates that amongst trans men, about 3% report living with HIV. Um, and so higher than the general US population. In terms of testing and prevention, um, we know that trans, um, when we specifically look at trans women who have the highest rates of reported HIV, um, we know that there's a lot of awareness um, and a lot of proactive testing. So of um, uh, trans women surveyed, um, about 96% said that they had ever tested for HIV. So this is a really high rate. Um, and 82% reported that they test, tested, were tested for HIV in the last year. However, in terms of access to HIV preventive tools, um, PrEP is one of our strongest tools in our toolbox for preventing HIV. And we see really low levels of uptake of PrEP among trans women, even though there's high levels of awareness. So there's several possible reasons for this lack of PrEP uptake, um, including distrust of medical systems, a history of discrimination, poor access to care, poverty, lack of access to the medications, um, and patient concerns about drug-drug interactions with their hormone therapy for gender care. So IE concerns that PrEP might interfere with their estrogen. So part of what we can do as providers uh, is provide information for patients to make good informed decisions. So we know from studies that PrEP does not affect levels of testosterone or estrogen. There is some data that suggests that um, tenofovir diproxyl fumarate uh, levels may be decreased with estrogen, but we still see high efficacy of PrEP. So the recommendation is that trans women may need higher adherence to PrEP um, than say men who have sex with men. Um, uh, however, um, we, you know, it's still highly recommended and highly effective. Um, the other recommendation is that on demand or 211 prep may not be a good um, option for trans women on hormones um, just because of that potential for decreased tenofovir levels. <laughs> 
However, once again, PrEP does not affect on the, on the flip side, um, the efficacy of estrogen uh, or of testosterone for trans men. So important to let patients know. When we look at the HIV care cascade um, from prevention then into HIV care and engagement in care, we do see um, a drop off um, from linkage to care to engagement and to viral suppression, both for trans men and for trans women. And we suspect that a lot of the reasons for that drop off in engagement and the drop off in viral suppression are also related to all of those barriers that I mentioned on the previous slide. Other reasons why viral suppression might be lower in transgender communities um, uh, go into you know, several big buckets. So many structural determinants of health, social exclusion from housing and employment, um, mistreatment in healthcare settings, which um, would make people avoid care, um, access to information and access to healthcare, um, and violence and victimization are all um, relevant. Um, there is some uh, potential impact of hormones on HIV incidence. So for example, atrophic vaginitis caused by testosterone for trans men may deplete the vaginal uh, epithelial lining and therefore have higher incidence um, potentially for STIs and HIV. Um, there's definitely more research that needs to be done on this. And overall, the direct role that sex hormone, hormones play in altering the susceptibility of target cells to HIV and impacting viral load suppression is largely unknown. So I think these structural factors um, play much more heavily um, into this um, care cascade um, problem. And then individual level factors um, include higher rates of substance use, again, related to um, trauma, uh, discrimination and mental health issues um, uh, and um, uh, potentially inconsistent condom use um, and sex work. We again, need more data to better understand the root causes of some of these disparities and what we can do about them. Um, for example, implementation science studies to show us what works in these communities. And so luckily there is um, a fairly new National Institute of Health Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office um, that is dedicated to LGBTQIA plus issues. Um, in research. Um, and so uh, we're hoping that we'll get higher quality and more studies um, that help us elucidate some of these underlying factors and barriers. Again, historically, um, trans women have often been kind of lumped into men who have sex with men in terms of interventions and in research and not really given their proper due in terms of thinking about them as a separate community. And then there's been even more of the lack of research on trans men and uh, non-binary or um, other gender non-conforming populations. So a need for more research on them. We do however know, and I'm sure all of you are quite aware, that there is um, a lot of discrimination that we see against uh, transgender and gender diverse people broadly. Um, so we know that uh, mistreatment at school, being physically attacked and verbally harassed and mistreatment at work are all higher than the general population. We also see, um, particularly in the South, this data comes from the Southern LGBT Health Survey from 2019, um, that among, uh, like within the LGBTQ community, um, that those who identify as transgender um, feel less comfortable seeking medical care than their cisgender peers in the LGBTQ community um, and uh, have uh, higher reported discrimination rates in healthcare. Some quotes that I pulled from this survey um, kind of uh, highlight the importance of affirming providers and the negative impact of discrimination in healthcare. So one person says, I haven't had many issues, but mainly because I keep my identity hidden. The fear, despite having little to no firsthand abuse from being LGBT is strong in the South. I'm especially afraid to talk about mental health in the South. And that even when I am able to find a medical professional that I'm comfortable with, Almost always the office support staff and nursing staff treats me with disrespect and makes me feel my health information is at risk because I am LGBTQ. And then one quote that is about an affirming physician um, who really impacted this patient's care in a positive way. 
So this is helpful to think about just how those interpersonal relationships can really make or break um, a person's willingness to seek medical care. Um, and that this type of training needs to extend beyond just the physician providers or nurse practitioners, but include everybody on the care team, including the front desk staff, those answering the phones at the clinic, really all the touch points for a patient. We also know that um, there are legislative impacts on stigma. And unfortunately, uh, earlier this month, uh, we had a bill passed in the Texas legislature um, that forbids uh, transgender children from playing on sports teams that align with their gender identity. Um, we know from prior research um, that uh, when laws are passed that are discriminatory towards LGBTQ um, youth, um, that there, seem, there is a correlation with an uptick, uptick um, in bullying um, against people, uh, people and especially kids who identify as LGBTQ. So this can have far reaching implications um, and can have really negative effects. We know that this type of stigma and discrimination impacts uh, mental and physical health uh, and negatively impacts quality of life um, and HIV care. So stigma and discrimination reported by transgender patients with HIV negatively correlate with gender affirmation, uh, with viral load suppression and with healthcare empowerment. We also know on the flip side that providing gender affirming care actually improves health. So these are just some of many studies that show that uh, different aspects of gender affirming care along the gender affirming care spectrum, anything from providing affirmation of a person's chosen name and pronouns all the way through to um, medical therapies and surgery um, do have a positive impact on mental health. And we also know that they impact HIV adherence. Um, so we know that lack of access to gender affirming hormone replacement therapy and surgery are actually associated with um, HIV treatment interruptions. So not having that care co-located can hurt HIV care. Um, and then on the flip side, that gender affirming hormone replacement therapy increases the likelihood of a transgender patient being on HIV treatment. One New York study um, showed that um, HIV positive transgender women, um, when they were able to combine their hormone replacement therapy uh, care visits with their HIV care, um, they reported decreased self-medication of hormones. So this is buying hormones on the street, injecting without you know, proper supervision of their lab values. Um, so potentially danger there. They had decreased sharing of needles. So obviously that's going to reduce the risk of um, uh, contracting uh, hepatitis C or passing HIV, decreased reliance on sex work to pay for their hormones because they're able to access it through their clinic, increased adherence to their HIV meds, and also increased condom use. Um, so really good data that shows that co-location of gender care can help improve viral suppression in HIV care. All of these data are why uh, the HIV um, Medicine Association and IDSA uh, specifically recommend gender affirming care as part of HIV care for transgender people. And so that's part of why hopefully you're here listening to this talk is because we wanna be able as HIV care providers to provide this as well. So how do you do that? So, the first thing that we can do in terms of providing gender affirming care is to look at what we call your system, um, meaning that a lot of the structures that we have in medical care were built with a cisgender person in mind. Um, so there's a lot of structural barriers to providing gender affirming care that we will see throughout the medical system. So it's really important to take a critical eye to your healthcare system and figure out ways that you can make it more affirming. So for example, do you have gender neutral bathrooms in your facility? What do your intake form look, forms look like? What does your EMR look like? Do you have documentation that integrates gender neutral language and includes options for patients to identify a chosen name rather than their legal name and pronouns um, and um, to mark the organs that they have, for instance? It's also really important to have uh, not only, as I mentioned, provider training, but staff training. 
um, and to include the transgender community locally, if possible, in that training um, so that you're not having cisgender people teach cisgender people, um, but also having input from the transgender community. Um, and I have done this myself, um, given presentations like this, um, like this one to members of the transgender community to get feedback. And it's hugely helpful because there's a lot of blind spots that we may have, um, and language is always evolving and changing. So it's really an ongoing and iterative process to educate ourselves um, in partnership with the community. And then just a reminder that it's really important to only ask personal questions about somebody's um, uh, sex organs or identity as it relates to medical care, um, not just out of curiosity. Other things that can be helpful are um, signage. So um, wearing a button with your pronouns um, or another kind of affirming symbol on your white coat um, and um, having peer navigators. So people who identify within the LGBTQ community and specifically transgender people um, who work in your clinic and can kind of provide that peer navigation support. We also really need to make sure that we have coordinated services because there are so many needs that the transgender um, community faces disproportionate to others. Um, it's really important that we make sure that patients are getting transportation access, shelter, housing, food support, um, legal help. All of these things should be part of a patient-centered medical home and can improve access to care, HIV care and viral load suppression. These are just examples of a couple of electronic medical records that I use in my institution. And um, the top is Epic, the bottom is Cerner. And in both of them, there are places where you can identify a patient's gender identity, their birth sex, their sexual orientation, things like that, that then show up in the EMR. So that can be really helpful. Um, in Epic as well, we have a function that was written in where a person's chosen name is much bigger and bolder than their legal name, which will be below it. So that helps um, to ensure that staff are not misgendering patients, for example, and that when notes populate, they use the chosen name and the chosen pronouns rather than the legal name. And it can get tricky because a lot, a lot of times insurance will require the legal name for um, processing bills and, and things like that. Um, so uh, it really requires a whole team working with your um, IT and EMR um, teams to make sure that um, the notes are affirming um, and that your system is working for your transgender patients and not against them. Some other communi communication tips I just wanted to share um, were um, introducing yourself, including your own pronouns. Um, it can be helpful to have patients write down on an intake sheet on paper what their name and pronouns are so that you have that from the get-go and that's entered in by your front desk staff along with their name. Um, as I mentioned, making sure that the patient's chosen name and not what is sometimes referred to as their dead name or the legal name that they do not want to use is not uh, repeated uh, or in the patient notes. Um, sometimes patients have particular words um, that they want to use for their body parts. For example, a trans woman may not want to refer to her genitals as a penis if she has one. Um, so asking, you know, if there are any preferred terms or, or words, and then always asking permission before you touch a patient, especially if it's a sensitive exam, can just show respect and make sure that the patient knows that they are in control. Um, again, a lot of um, Patients who identify as transgender have had uh, more traumatic experiences, whether it be family rejection, bad experiences in the medical system, and part of trauma-informed care is making sure that patients know that they are in control and they are able to um, know what's coming. Uh, and so just being aware of that can help. I don't mean this to be a totally extensive overview of how to give hormone replacement therapy for gender care, but I did wanna share um, a basic checklist um, and then feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in uh, a one to two pager kind of helpful guide um, for, for starting uh, or continuing gender affirming hormone therapy. Um, what I usually do is um, at the first visit, I'll complete a full history and physical. Um, 
I will, um, this is a little bit out of order for what I do, to be honest, and I can revise this, but I'll usually start out by collecting um, a gender history um, and uh, making a diagnosis of gender dysphoria. Um, the DSM has a full um, criteria for gender dysphoria, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's at least six months of um, the patient feeling um, discomfort um, in the incongruence between their um, sex assigned at birth and their gendered identity. Um, and there's a few more uh, points that um, you can look up. Um, in terms of the gender history, um, you generally want to ask how long they've been on hormone replacement therapy, or if this is the first time they're starting, what their goals are. Um, so their goals for hormone replacement therapy, their goals for their gender expression. This can also be a helpful time to set expectations and talk about uh, the time course of the effect of the medications so that patients are aware. Um, you're going to collect a sexual and social health history. Um, review any medicines they might be on and make sure there's no interactions and then ask them about their past medical and surgical history so that you can better understand their risk factors. Risk factors for estrogen, um, I have on another slide, but uh, briefly a higher risk for venous thromboembolism. Um, so you wanna ask about smoking history, um, how sedentary or active they are. None of these are direct contraindications, but um, if they do have risk factors, it may influence um, one, your counseling, like for smoking cessation, uh, but also may influence the type of hormone therapy that you recommend. For example, transdermal formulations um, are thought to be less uh, thrombophilic than uh, PO or oral formulations. In terms of testosterone, um, really the biggest risk is one of uh, polycythemia if the testosterone level is too high. Um, so we do check uh, the hematocrit and follow that. Um, and then you want to ask about interest in other gender affirming surgeries. Are they planning on having surgery? Do they want referrals for voice therapy? Uh, do they want referrals for dermatology, for hair removal, things like that, that you can help facilitate hopefully. It's also important, especially if the patient is starting out um, and um, wants to have their own biologic children, it's really important to talk about fertility goals because these hormones can have irreversible effects on the ability to have children. So either spermogenesis um, or egg quality or uh, ability to ovulate. Um, and so if they do desire their own biologic children, you want to counsel them about the effects of these medications and refer them to things like freezing um, services, you know, freezing sperm, freezing eggs, um, if that is what they want to do. On the flip side, it is not a guarantee that somebody cannot get pregnant or get somebody pregnant um, if they are on hormones. Um, and so if somebody is capable of becoming pregnant, um, you want to counsel them about that and talk about contraception. Um, finally, we, um, obtain baseline labs, um, which I can go into a bit later. And, um, there is an informed consent process, which can be either verbal or written verbal, meaning that you've discussed the risks and benefits of the therapy and answer questions. Uh, and then we go ahead and we generally write for a three month supply with needles on the same day. Um, we don't generally wait, um, to have labs back before starting again, cause we're trying to reduce the barriers, um, to getting this hormone therapy. And it's, uh, it's generally very well tolerated. Um, there can be a check-in either by phone or in person, um, a week or two later, just to see how the patient is doing, but it's not totally necessary. So this is the expected time course that you can help to, um, it can be helpful to counsel patients on for testosterone. And I won't belabor this because we don't have enough time to really focus on it, but um, uh, you can access this at uh, the WPATH site. That's the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And then um, expected time course of changes with estradiol. So testosterone is the hormone that we use for uh, trans men um, and masculinizing effects. Testosterone alone will suppress estrogen. So that's the only one that we give for trans women or those who want feminizing effects. We use a combination usually of estrogen in the form of estradiol. Um, uh, and we use, um, uh, an androgen blocker, usually spironolactone because, uh, estrogen alone doesn't always suppress, um, testosterone to levels that are, um, wanted. <laughs> 
These are some of the risks associated with hormone therapy. So for estrogen, um, I mentioned the venous thromboembolic disease and some risk factors for cardiovascular disease and hyperlipidemia and for masculinizing hormones. Um, again, not enough research has been done. So um, other than polycythemia, the others are not definitive, um, but there's some signals that they might increase other cardiovascular risk factors. And then finally, preventive care is really based on organ system. Um, so you're going to do the same kind of organ-based care. The only um, difference that I'll mention is that for trans women who have been on at least five years of estrogen, if they are above 50, then they should um, go ahead and start getting mammograms because they will have developed breast tissue by then that needs to be screened for breast cancer. At follow-up visits, you're going to ask about physical changes. How are they feeling? How close are they to their goal gender expression? You use that along with your lab values. What you're trying to do is get them into a mid physiologic range for their goal gender um, and uh, titrate uh, along that goal, along with their goal gender expression. You want to ask about any side effects of the medication um, and um, adjust the dosing as needed. We generally follow up about every three months for the first year. And then in the second year, about every six months, and then it can be annually thereafter once they've kind of plateaued and are reaching their goals and are on a stable dose. In terms of drug interactions between hormone replacement therapy, specifically um, medical hormones and antiretroviral therapy, um, we don't have a lot of evidence. <laughs> There's a theme here. We need more research um, for a lot of things related to transgender healthcare. Um, most of the evidence that we have is based on oral contraceptives for cisgender women, um, uh, ethanol estradiol, which we do not use for um, trans women because really uh, there's a higher thromboembolic risk um, with uh, OCPs for cis women um, because they're a little bit better at controlling menstrual cycles, um, which is not necessary for trans women. Um, so that said, however, we do have data that shows that most of our modern ART regimens and all of the currently recommended first line regimens for HIV, for HIV can safely be used um, with these hormones. Some notes that I'll make about specific HIV medicines are that um, some of our NNRTIs, including efavirenz, atravirine, and the VRPN do decrease testosterone and estrogen levels. So you may just have to kind of monitor with the lab values and um, you know, titrate the dosage. All the boosted PIs seem to decrease um, estrogen and may increase testosterone. So again, this can be dealt with by just monitoring the labs every three months and adjusting as needed. And then um, COB may decrease or increase estradiol and increase testosterone levels. So some interactions here. However, um, it does not appear that testosterone or estrogen has a negative effect in suppressing the levels of the antiretroviral drugs. So that's really good. And then both uh, TDF FTC and TAF FTC can safely be taken with hormones. Um, but as I mentioned before, um, there's some data that hormones may um, decrease the level slightly, um, so should not be taken on demand. Um, in terms of a full list of drug-drug interactions, um, you can refer to the uh, DHHS guidelines, um, table 17 that I listed here. So in general, um, what I want to stress is that there's a lot of nuance and a lot of tailoring that goes into gender affirming care. Um, so taking into account a patient's HIV regimen, um, their personal gender expression goals, their history, um, and any side effects um, that they may have, it's all going to influence the regimen that you create for them. However, there are some basic start and stop points. Um, and there are um, a lot of resources out there to help you. Again, I'm happy to share kind of that one pager um, that I've put together with some other colleagues, um, if anybody finds it helpful, um, that has starting doses, dosages for estrogen and testosterone and spironolactone. Um, and then uh, I have some resources listed on the next slide, I believe. A um, lot of different resources here for where you can find um, protocols for um, 
hormone replacement therapy and best practices. And so in summary, I just wanted to say that um, transgender patients do have higher rates of HIV incidence and lower PrEP uptake than cisgender patients. We know that systemic racism and structural inequality fuels some of these disparities. We know that gender affirming care improves mental health and HIV engagement in care and is recommended by both IDSA and HIVMA. PrEP and all first line single tablet ART regimens are safe to use with hormone replacement therapy for gender affirming care. And that transgender communities and individuals need culturally competent patient-centered medical homes to address all of their needs, including trauma, social determinants of health, um, their gender affirming care, HIV care and prevention. And so again, here are the resources and I will end. Um, feel free to email me with questions. Um, I'd love feedback about this talk, what you'd like to hear more of or less of. Um, and thank you for having me.